Hi, everybody. I'm Helen Robinson. I'm the managing editor of the Colorado Springs Business Journal. Welcome to the fifth community conversation where we'll talk about cybersecurity and how you can keep your organization safe. First of all, we'd like to thank our sponsors for this series, Pikes Peak Association of Realtors, the Colorado Springs Housing and Building Association, Remax Incorporated, and Colorado Mountain Properties for Real Estate. In-Home Healthcare is sponsored by Gentle Shepherd Home Care. This cybersecurity conversation is sponsored by Digital Beachhead, Firma IT Solutions, and Colorado Computer Support. The final panel about human resources is sponsored by HR Branches. So please welcome with me today's guest speakers, Rodney Gallette Jr. of Firma IT Solutions, Mike Crandall of Beach, Digital Beachhead, and Blake Schwank of Colorado Computer Support. Um, and remember, we'll take your questions at the end of the session. So we'll start with introductions. Um, please each take some time to talk about yourselves and your organizations. Blake, we'll start with you. So I'm Blake Schwank with uh, Colorado Computer Support. Um, we're an IT services uh, company here in Colorado Springs. We help our clients uh, if they're trying to grow, trying to expand, or if they just have challenges internal with uh, IT. Uh, I'm basically uh, from Colorado Springs, moved here uh, a long time ago as an Air Force brat, went to uh, UCCS, and then uh, went in the Army for, 10, for 11 years. And uh, my wife and I moved back here in 1999, and we started uh, Colorado Computer Support in 2000. And uh, we're just coming up on our uh, 20th anniversary here. So very excited to, to do that um, in May. And, um, and so we do a lot of uh, healthcare IT support, a lot of uh, K-12, and a variety of uh, other businesses to in, in include uh, DOD contractors and such and help them out with CMMC. So nice to meet everybody. Great, thanks a lot, Blake. Rodney, let's go with you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rodney Galletta. I'm a certified ethical hacker, certified network defense architect, and certified chief information security officer. I'm also the CEO of Firma IT Solutions. We do managed IT and cybersecurity services for small businesses in our community and in Key West, Florida, and all over the country. It's pretty nice. Um, like my friend Blake, I too am a veteran, uh, but of the greatest Air Force the world has ever seen. So, you know, still love the Army, much love to the Army. Um, so our company, we, we're looking after your lawyers, your accountants, your medical providers, right? All those people that are, are managing your personal information right now and don't know how to protect it. We're trying to help them make better decisions. So that's what we do um, on several boards here in town and just trying to do uh, a good job for the people. So thank you for having me here today. Thanks, Rodney. Mike, thank can you. you tell everyone about yourself? Hi, I'm Mike Crandall. I am the CEO of Digital Beachhead. Uh, we started the company in 2015 uh, after I retired from the Air Force in 2010. I went out and worked for a large government contractor, kind of learned that if I was working that hard for someone, I might as well work that hard for myself. So that's why we started Digital Beachhead. It's a term I coined when I was in the military saying that I secured the Digital Beachhead for the DOD. I like Rodney, an Air Force guy. So uh, go Air Force. Sorry, Army. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, this is an Air Force town, really, even though there's a big Army base. Um, we provide cybersecurity uh, support to small to medium sized businesses and the federal government, state and local governments. Um, primarily, we provide uh, cyber assessments as a third party uh, outside entity looking into your IT department to tell you how you can uh, tighten up the ship and maybe do things a little better. And we take all the experience we've learned and I've learned in the federal government and kind of bring it into the small and medium sized market at an affordable price. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. We're gonna jump right into questions. Um, while we're talking, please put any of your questions in the chat box. And um, for the first question, Rodney, we'll start with you. Um, cyber crime and cyber attacks have gotten worse since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we've got scam domains, Zoom accounts for sale on the dark web, brute force attacks are spiking. What kinds of threats are you seeing locally? I am seeing a lot of ransomware. I am seeing a lot of uh, attacks coming in through people's emails because folks are clicking on things that they shouldn't be clicking on. And it looks real, but it's not real. When you click on it, you're done. It just takes one click on one person's computer on a network 
and you're done. But I'll tell you what, the thing that's bothering me the most right now, especially recently, are managed IT service providers that are predatory. Okay, so you have three experts on this call right now. We care about the people. If you're looking for these services, call one of us or call all three of us. See which one's the right fit. But you've got three here that you can trust. But I tell you, there's a few more here in town that are really good. But there's other ones here practicing this craft that are that did not have your best interests at heart. And they are writing contracts that are not in your best interest. And if you don't read those contracts, that's your fault. And if you don't understand the contract, that's your fault also. There's a lot of resources to help you with those. If you don't understand what your contract means, contact the SBDC and sign up for a consult with me. And I'll help you read through that contract and make sure it's not something that's going to destroy you. Uh, a lot of these companies, when they decide to pull away from you or when you want to cut ties with them, they might take away your network. They'll take away your email. You don't even own your servers or your servers are set up in a way where you keep your physical box of a server, but they take everything that's on it away from you. Um, I had an incident this week where they shut off the client's Wi-Fi on Monday and ended their services on uh, Sunday, and they wouldn't take time to talk to me. Just a 30-minute conversation is all I needed or less. Um, they wouldn't speak to me. They didn't tell me what kind of stuff was set up on this network. I did my best to reverse engineer it, but, man, that's just one example. I've seen a lot worse happen. Um, and they had an anti-defamation clause in their termination contract, so the client can't even talk bad about them or tell them, like, what happened to them. So, you know, we have people that really care for you, and this is a, a lot of power that companies like ours have over your business. So you don't want to trust that to somebody that you're paying $10 an hour or that you don't have a good contract with or a good working relationship with. Trust is key in this one. Thanks, Rodney. Welcome. Uh, Blake, what kind of threats are you seeing locally? Yeah, I want to, I you know, piggyback on Rodney on the, on the ransomware. It's, it's really crazy. We, we really need to make sure that we have layers of security in place because that one click, we just, we just helped. They, they weren't a client. We were engaged to help them recover. Um, but we spent weeks on it because one employee clicked on one email and within 50 minutes, they had three sites around, around the country that were completely encrypted and locked down and shut down. They sent everybody home. So it's, it's, it's this, this stuff is critical. So the, the gift cards, the phishing, the stuff where they're asking you to send checks, you know, that's important, but it's, it's, it's small compared to some of these other attacks. Um, we've seen people that, you know, get an email, you know, we need you to send $30,000, you know, otherwise they're going to shut us off and they're not going to ship that. Um, actually, uh, heard about one the other day where it actually made it, they, they hit them once. They sent the check, nobody noticed. They hit him a second time, they sent the check, nobody noticed. They hit him the third time, this time the check was over a million bucks, so someone asked real questions, and uh, they, they ended up stopping it at that point. Um, the, uh, um, it just, it's getting more and more real looking. We used to be able to look for misspellings, for things that just didn't look right, but now it's looking more and more real. They copy someone's signature block, and they, you know, they send it with your signature block to your assistant and say, hey, this is really critical. We need to get it out today. So, the, um, you know, we got to watch out for those things. Um, and another thing Rodney mentioned is, is, is make sure that you're, you're finding, um, he's got a great point on the, 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 the IT providers, but our industry is a target now. So it used to be just the internal IT guys were targets. Now that, that you know, those IT companies that don't have the right processes set in place, don't have the right security in place, are huge targets because they're supporting 30, 40 businesses. You get to one of them, you can get out to everybody. Um, you know, you work for us, and, and it is really difficult to get to work in the morning because you have to go through so many steps before you can log into our tools to actually do anything. And that's what, you know, and so I think that's the next big uh, vector in our industry to, is going after those guys. Thanks, Blake. Mike, what are you seeing? Well, I would like to jump on board again with the one click. I think we need to start a rock band of IT professionals and, you know, create a song like don't click, one click will kill you or, you know, some sort of rock song like that, because that is really the keys. We can set up all kinds of boundaries and protections and firewalls and everything that people want to want to believe that if they spend the money on, they'll be safe. And then you have the one employee that clicks the email and none of that is important and it's all moot. Um, Lafayette, Colorado was recently hit with a ransomware attack. Uh, $45,000 was paid. Um, and that was because it was cheaper, cheaper than providing 
and going back and recovering. So you have to do the cost analysis and sometimes sadly paying is cheaper than, you know, fighting it the hard way to recover. Um, I say cheaper, it's cheaper in the short run. Um, I grew up in New York and uh, I look at it as the old mafia scheme where, you know, I'm here to give you insurance on your storefront, but my storefront's fine. And then they destroy the storefront and says, see, it's not fine. <laughs> pay me my insurance money. So cyber attacks will come back. If you pay the, the uh, ransomware, I'm sure they'll come back. So I'm seeing locally all kinds of phishing and ransomware. And uh, I think it's getting more sophisticated and more targeted instead of the generic, hi, welcome, click here for some fun, fun prizes. It's, it's got stuff off your social media. They're going out and collecting data on you and crafting messages just for you. So those in senior leadership and even those just regular employees, they know a lot about you because we put a lot of our information online. So I think we have to step back and look how we live in the digital age and, and really take that uh, to heart because the cyber attackers are coming after us. Thanks, Mike. Blake, we'll start with you for this next question. Thanks to the pandemic, organizations have turned to remote work with more employees using personal devices than ever before and with Zoom becoming the norm. What does this new work model mean for cybersecurity? I think it, uh, it, it opens up a lot of new uh, holes. Some of them are obvious, like the, you know, someone taking their computer home and letting their kids play on it, right? Um, but it's other things. One of the things is, you know, we sent our team home March 17th, and immediately we started helping our clients connect to their, their servers, either in-house or on the cloud. Um, and, you know, what, uh, and, and there's a secure way to do that, and there's an insecure way to do that. In some of the clients that we've picked up since the, uh, since the pandemic hit, what we found out is, is they opened up a access to their network that was insecure. And so it worked. It was awesome. The, the you know, CEO could go home and access the entire network, do everything that they needed to do. Unfortunately, then that was a, a hole to a hacker because someone didn't know what they're doing. And they, they just opened it up because they Googled how to open up my network and all of a sudden they let this stuff in. And so we've seen those instances where it's wide open, we need to secure it. Um, and then uh, just for employers, having this, the right policies and security in place so that when they send an employee home, they do have um, rules for how they can work on the network, what they can access. Thanks, Blake. Mike, what do you have to add on that? Um, I think with the bring your own devices of um, working from home with the pandemic, what we don't realize is we just added uh, X number, an exponential number of users to your network. Um, in my home, I'm not necessarily the only one sharing my Wi-Fi. Um, so your kids are now on your network. Your spouse is now on your network. Your network is, uh, if you happen to go to a coffee shop or McDonald's to grab a cup of coffee and do a little work because you're working remotely, all those people are now on your company network. So it's something to uh, take into mind that Working from home, you think you've restricted it, but actually you've expanded your, your users and access to your equipment. Thanks, Mike. Rodney, what can you tell us about working from home and cybersecurity? Um, so businesses shouldn't have employees using their personal computers um, for work. Uh, that's not a great setup. Uh, if possible, businesses should purchase the computers that their employees are using to work for them. Uh, so you don't run into that issue uh, that Blake was talking about. And um, that way you own the asset and you can manage it um, as you see fit. If it's somebody else's property, you can't have 100% control over somebody else's laptop. You don't know what they're doing on that thing. Um, some folks are looking, uh, like Blake was saying, some people are looking on Google uh, for how to set up remote access for their computers at work. So um, I don't know if we have any uh, any geeks on the call, but you know that's remote desktop protocol from Microsoft most of the time. At least that's that's my favorite setup. Um, so they're configuring a hole in their firewall. I know it sounds bad, right? A hole in their firewall for port 3389. And all the hackers know that port, and we're waiting for all the traffic on that port on your network because there's a hole in your firewall for it. There shouldn't be any holes in your firewall. Um, you should use a VPN. So um, I'm a big 
um, proponent of having VPN set up in your office um, so that you can remote into your office from anywhere. Um, and I'm not talking about the paid VPN service from some provider like NordVPN or something like that. I'm not talking about that. I don't trust those because I don't know those people. But I trust the VPN that I set up in an office because I know where it's at. I know how it's set up. Um, and people on their home networks, like Mike was saying, uh, it's, it's important to have secure networks at home. And this can be done uh, fairly inexpensively. Um, and if you don't have that, if you are at home, hop on your guest Wi-Fi and do your business work on that network instead, um, because your guest network is separated from your kids that are playing PlayStation and your smart TVs and your ring and all of the stuff that you have on your network. Um, and you'll, you'll be pigeonholed with just an access from your computer to the internet and that's it. So use your guest network if you're at home and try to stay off those public Wi-Fi's. Use your uh, hotspots. Some of you have them on your phones. Um, some of the cellular providers have them as uh, devices you can pick up. Verizon uses something called a jetpack. So use that instead of using public Wi-Fi because those things aren't safe either. Thanks, Radney. Welcome. Mike, we'll start with you on this question. So in the pandemic, we've got small businesses struggling and employees are already stretched thin. Mm -hmm. So what's the answer? How can businesses tackle cybersecurity threats while they're working with less? Well, I think the good thing to remember is that you have to allocate resources based on not only need, but based on your size, scope. Uh, the privacy law for Colorado um, that was passed in 2018 says that you have to protect the data based on the size and scope of your company. So someone who has 500 employees uh, definitely needs to do more than someone who runs a coffee shop and there's four teenage employees that are part-time. Um, so you have to kind of be realistic in what you do, but you must provide some sort of due diligence. Due diligence is required. So we like to say some companies come out and Rodney was talking about this where, you know, you have these shady companies, whatever, and they're like, we're going to come in and we're going to do the biggest pen test ever. We're going to break into all your machines. And I akin that to, I want you to come and do the physical security of my home, but I left the front door open. Well, there's no need for me to do that pen test right away because I've already got the front door open. I'm standing in your living room and going, ta-da, I broke into your house. Maybe I can come to you and say, hey, why don't we lock the doors? Why don't we shut, you know, shut the door first, lock the door second, lock the windows, maybe put a camera in, give you some basics, which is much less expensive than coming in and doing a deep dive probe of your company. And then once you take in those steps and those mitigation factors, maybe down the line, you can program in and budget for that kind of thing. So again, think of your size, allocate what you can and uh, do what you must, but you have to take some action. Due diligence is required. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Blake, what can businesses do when they're working with less to take care of cybersecurity? Yeah, I, I, I love Mike's example. I kind of use the same thing is, is it is like your house, you know? Depending on where you live and what you do, sometimes a, a, a deadbolt's fine. But that's, I mean, really, for most of us, it's, it's not that. We need bars on the window. We need everything else. If you're doing healthcare, you've got to have the bars on the window. You've got to have the armed response. You've got to have cameras inside. You've got to have all this stuff to protect your house. And it's the same thing um, to some extent with this. And, and, you know, I know it's hard to budget for. And so, you know, we help our clients sort of implement this over over time if they can't afford to do it right because they just need to start getting this stuff in place. Um, just having antivirus anymore and a, and, and a backup is not enough. And so um, if you can't afford it, you know, to do it all right now, um, you know, someone asked the question in the chat a little bit ago, you know, do backups help? And absolutely, if, if, if you get ransomware um, and if all they're doing is encry encrypting your data and not selling it, then you know backups help you recover from that. And so backups are expensive to do them right, but it's cheaper than being shut down for two months. You know, what's your, what's your lost revenue? Um, the other thing is, is make sure we have cyber insurance in place so that if that happens, you're not having to foot that 100 or 200 or $300,000 bill to, re to recover your business out of, out of your funds. Um, and then, uh, you know, use solutions that involve um, artificial intelligence, marine, uh, machine learning, so that you're not having to have people actually 
um, analyzing your network and looking for threats, you know, looking through logs. People can't look through logs. We have to have tools that, that look through that for the threats that are coming in. Um, and then, you know, I know we talked, Mike talked about doing a pen test, you know, find out where your gaps are and what are most critical. People don't know where to start. If you have someone that, you know, we, we have our, our medical clients go through a security risk assessment because that actually outlines what their high, medium, and low risks are. And it's not just me coming and telling you, you got to spend all this money. And then it actually makes sense so that you can plan it out based on your business, what the biggest threats are. So you have someone like Mike that does, you know, primarily audits and he comes through and he tells you what, you know, where your gaps are, where you need to be spending your focus right now. Thanks, Blake. Rodney, what can you tell us about this? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. I'm over here chatting with my friend, Ekta. Hey, Ekta. Um, so uh, take care of the basics, okay? There's stuff that you can do by yourself without having to hire a professional. Things like your passwords. All your passwords should be different for every online account that you have. You should not be saving passwords, and they should be long. Long, at least 10 characters. I like 20, but at least 10. Uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols. No words, no dictionary words, not even dictionary words in other languages. Don't do that. If you are using a Windows computer, like most people, um, make sure that your computers are running Windows 10 Pro Edition. Not the Home Edition, the Pro Edition. There's two different versions. Now, once you have the Pro Edition on your computers, you also need to engage a technology called BitLocker. Don't know what that is? Google that. You find a YouTube video that'll tell you how to engage that technology. In that case, especially for all those of you using laptops for your business, if somebody steals your laptop, what information do they have on your business? Can they cripple you? Are you going to be sending out a breach notification to all your clients? In this day and age, in 2021, that should not be the case if you encrypt your hard drives. Um, use a um, two-factor authentication, okay, on all of your accounts. So that means using your username and password to log in and it'll either send a text to your phone or you can use an authenticator app. So Google makes one, Microsoft makes one, LastPass makes one. It's a lot of those. And it's a six-digit code that changes every 60 seconds. So if at all possible, use the authenticator app instead of the text message. But if the authenticator app is not available as an option, use the text message. Any type of two-factor authentication is good to have. Um, get knowledge from the SBDC. I'm going I'm to harp on this because there's, there, there's free resources for you out here pikespeakspdc.org, like do check them out. I'm a consultant with them. You can have a consult with me. I'll talk to you all day long. It's not a problem. We have classes that we give out. We're going to have some new stuff coming out this year. Um, that resource is available to you. Knowledge is power. You can hashtag that. If we can train your people, do send your employees to us at the SBDC. Let us do your cybersecurity awareness training annually so we can help them understand. Because if you know not to click on that email and you've got trained on what those emails look like, you're not going to click on them anymore. Um, a lot of IT service providers do free cybersecurity assessments on your business. Now, let me help you understand the difference between a pen test that my friends were talking about and a, like a cyber assessment. So when I come in to businesses, they usually don't have an IT department, right? They don't have anything. So an assessment, I can sit down and look at your computer. I can just look at your desktop and see several vulnerabilities right off the bat just by looking at your desktop. Now, a penetration test, I would recommend those if you have a mature IT department or you may have an IT provider already um, and you want to check the locks on your system. So this is an actual hack, right? You are going to pay a company to hack into your business. It's going to cost money and it will give you a report with all the gaps and then you can go get the gaps fixed. So that's my information on that question. I hope it helps. Thanks, Rodney. You're welcome. Uh, we'll bounce back to you first for this next question. What about the cybersecurity pipeline here in the Springs? Um, is demand still outstripping supply for us? Rodney, we'll go to you. Is demand outstripping supply? Um, when I look at it from the government standpoint, that seems to be the case. There seems to be a struggle getting good talent uh, into all these open positions. But I tell you what, there's another gap um, the small businesses that don't usually get talked about. Everybody's government, government, government. But I'm telling you, like your lawyer and your chiropractor and like your accountant, especially your accountants, tax season, man, I know they have no encryption on their machines. Some of them, they have the same password, which is like Bronco 7 or something like that for their passwords for everything. Everything is wide open with them. And 
I think once the small business community starts to realize that they also need to hire professionals to do this work for them, um, there's going to be an even higher demand that's not really there right now. So I appreciate the Business Journal having this forum so we can educate our small business community on, on what their needs are. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of organizations that's helping to try to shrink in um, that, um, the lack of people that we need. Pikes Peak Workforce Center is working on it. Pikes Peak Community College is working on it. There's a lot of people working, um, what is it, uh, Secure Set. Like there's, there's a lot of places that are working to spit out those, um, those engineers that we need uh, to keep us safe. Thanks, Rodney. Uh, Blake, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, um, yeah, I agree with Rodney. The other, the other challenge that we have is, is the uh, level of experience. So we've, we've got some great training going on here in the Springs, um, both for, you know, people coming out of high school or wanting to go get retrained. The military does a great job of, of training people up when they get out. And so we have this, 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 this pool of resources that we can reach out to. Unfortunately, until they spend several years in this, um, it's really hard to be an expert at, at doing this, uh, doing this kind of work. Um, and so that's where we usually run into a challenge is trying to find the, the, the people that are several years or more experienced that, uh, that have a passion for this. Um, and that's where we're running into, into trouble. So. Thanks, Blake. Um, Mike, what can you tell us about the cybersecurity workforce pipeline here? Yeah, I worked with uh, Pikes Peak Community College when they were doing a workforce study, and uh, we found that there are tons of jobs available for uh, cybersecurity folks, and there's not necessarily the pipeline to fill it. A uh, big problem here in the Springs, as Rodney pointed out, is the military side. Everyone needs to have a clearance, so it's hard to match a clearance with cybersecurity knowledge so they can come out. And then to what Blake said, if years of experience, we were finding they wanted a CISSP beginner. Entry level position must have CISSP. And a CISSP is a high level cybersecurity certification that you must have years of experience to even gain. So to say you're an entry level CISSP required, you're not gonna find that position. So I think there's a gap between what people think they need, what is there available and uh, the folks that are out there but uh, all the resources I mentioned, and I'm also the vice president of the local chapter of the ISSA. Um, we help provide uh, some training to folks that are members and non-members alike to help you know, bring up our cybersecurity career field. And I think we need to do more work uh, with STEM and starting in the high schools to at least get people interested, specifically um, uh, people of color and then the, the, the women that are out there. Um, STEM has always been the white geeky guy kind of sport that everyone thought of. And that's not true. It's open to everyone. Everyone has an option here. So we really need to get that out and, uh, you know, keep pushing forward because when we broaden our horizons of who can do it, then everyone can be available to take part. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, Blake, I'll throw this one to you first. Um, do you think uncertainty over the future location of U.S. Space Force will affect the demand for cybersecurity professionals here in the Springs? Um, what, what might that look like? I think it'll affect the, the job opportunities at Space Force if they move it. But I think, you know, we, having been here since uh, the 70s, you know, yeah, the this, this, this city has always uh, been around um, the government, around the military and stuff. And a lot of us are supporting not just DOD contractors and stuff, but, or, or in Mike's case, actually flying out to Guam, you know, one-on-one -on -one with the military. But, you know, the, there's a lot of businesses here that support the DOD that still need cybersecurity help. And they're not gonna go anywhere. If, if Space Force moves to Huntsville, those companies are still gonna stay here. Now, what's gonna happen is there's going to be more businesses that might support Space Force or, you know, other, other changes in the military but I don't, I don't see it affecting us too much. Plus, the, with the uh, with the addition of, or the the need to be CMMC compliant, that's just really going to increase the requirements for cybersecurity here in Colorado Springs because there's two or three hundred DoD contractors here that need to be CMC, CMMC compliant. Thanks, Blake. Uh, Mike, what what do you think, Mike? I I agree that uh, I think your Space Force 
ends its way back here, you know, due to the shift in politics as what happens every four years, um, two years sometimes, depending on how the Congress goes in between. But uh, if it comes here, then there'll be more jobs available. If it doesn't stay here, I don't see us losing too awful much. I think um, the companies will stay. Uh, CMMC is, is, of course, always going to be on the horizon. Uh, NIST standards, even for those that aren't working in government but want to have a standard to go to. Um, so I don't, I don't see it hurting us if it leaves. I just see it enhancing us if it stays. Thanks, Mike. Rodney, what are your thoughts? I say for all of my folks in Olympic City, USA, do not give up on Space Force yet. It's not in Alabama yet. OK, your Colorado Springs Chamber and EDC is a very influential organization. They are trying to get that thing back. So just hold your horses. We'll see what happens with Space Force. But um, as far as the demand for cybersecurity, there's a huge demand right now. And the demand's not going away. I guess there'll just be more openings for positions if uh, Space Force is, uh, sticks around here. But we still have a demand issue. So let's, let's try to focus on that pipeline and all these organizations trying to feed us uh, new people and getting them the experience. You know, one thing that, that Blake was talking about um, is uh, people that go in for training, but you know, they don't know what all to do. I had a guy I hired who had a security plus um, and he didn't know how to do windows updates on a computer. I had to show him like three or four times. So I'm like, you know, the, the certs are great, but like the experience behind it, knowing how to do stuff is important too. So for all those people working on those programs, uh, to help us create that workforce. Um, and I, I put this out to all my um, my colleagues in this space with uh, businesses in IT and cyber. Um, open yourself up to, to bring in interns and help train this next generation of people so, um, so they can be ready because the threat is real and it's only going to get worse. Thanks, Rodney. Mike, let's talk about SolarWinds. Um, one of Microsoft's VPs last week came out and said the SolarWinds attack isn't an isolated emergency so much as the new normal that, quote, these attacks are going to continue to get more sophisticated. We should expect that. This is not the first and not the last. What does this mean for businesses in the Springs and for U.S. cybersecurity professionals? Well, I think, number one, I hope it brings another highlight to why cybersecurity is needed in all types and sizes of businesses. Um, I tend to relate it to, we've all seen the Ocean 11, Ocean 8 movies where there's a big heist and everyone hears about it. That's solar winds. You know, it took a lot of planning, a lot of professionalism, a lot of moving parts. They made it happen. And we hear about it because it's a great large haul that they got from it. But at the same time, how many 7-Elevens were robbed last night? Thousands across America. And we don't hear about it. In cyber, it doesn't need to be a thousand different criminals. It can be one criminal doing it a thousand times. And they come into your small business, they take your data, and you never even know they were there. So hopefully the solar winds attacks takes us to a level where small and medium-sized businesses say, oh, you know, I've heard of solar winds, or I know what that is, or how can they get into everyone? And if Microsoft is worried, should I be worried? So I hope it elevates our consciousness and our awareness of it and that we need to take action. Um, and one of the critical things I took out of uh, the SolarWinds hack is right now we have something called um, the CIA triad in cybersecurity, the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of your data. Um, we tend to focus on the C and the A. There's not much focus on the integrity. We think encryption is integrity. However, um, there is new software out there. We've partnered with a company in California that's a startup that provides integrity to your data in transit. So that way, if your log files are tampered with, because the first thing someone does when I go in to break into your system is I cover my tracks by deleting my log files. So you never know I was there. That's how these people can get in and stay in. So this will take your log files and it'll let you know if log files are have been tampered with while they're being collected at your log file collection point. So I think we need to look forward to providing more integrity in our systems, apart from just the confidentiality and availability. Thanks, Mike. Rodney, what do you think? I am glad you asked. So I want to set the expectation for everybody on the call that nothing is 100% secure. And nothing told us that quite like the solar winds. <laughs> that if they're coming after you, they're going to get you. Um, the thing they did with solar winds was specifically crafted for solar winds. 
They wanted them specifically, everything they did. So that was, that was pretty telling for me. Um, but businesses are getting hit here all the time. And um, I'm glad that, that uh, the press around the, the solar winds and all that stuff has happened because that, that has brought awareness, like Mike said. Um, the threat landscape is as hot as it's ever been. And for businesses not investing in um, managed IT or cyber, uh, please think about it. Please think about it. There's no time like the present. Um, uh, at least train your people um, to, to take measures that will protect you because your people, you know, we got all these external cyber threats, but your people, a lot of times are your, your biggest, your biggest threat. So um, just be safer, change those passwords. Thanks Rodney. Welcome. Blake, what are your thoughts on solar winds and what it means for us here? Yeah. If you want to make sure you're not, uh, you're not hacked, you need to go offline. Um, we got a TRS 80 here at Colorado computer support and, and, and that'll keep you safe. But if you <laughs> if you can't do that, um, the uh, you you just need to make sure you protect yourself in depth because it's not just solar winds and companies like that that they're going after. You know, it, it, there there's automated ta attacks that come after small business, but the software that those small businesses use, I mean, there are hackers that are trying all day every day to get into all of the remote access tools, where it's, whether it's TeamViewer or whether it's Microsoft that has remote control of a lot of systems or Google or all these things, they're trying their hardest to get into these things. So you got to have that security in depth like Mike was talking about earlier so that um, if it does happen to you or when it does happen to you, we can go ahead and stop it at the next layer. There's things that you can put in place that, you know, if, if you're breached, they see that you're breached and they automatically unplug all of your computers on your network. I mean, it can go to that level that, that we can protect or that there's tools out there can, that can protect it. So um, at a minimum, have a backup, have it offsite, have it automatically offsite. Don't rely on a person to do it so that if it does happen to you, you can, you can get back in, uh, in, in business and quit, and, and, and quit thinking about it's not going to happen to me. You don't have to look too far. There's little guys that it's happening to. There's massive guys that it's happening to. There's been hospitals, you know, here um, in Southern Colorado that have been encrypted and there's been little doctor's offices that have been encrypted. So um, pay attention to it, learn about it, go see the SBDC. You can call us. We'll sit down and have a conversation with you about it. Um, just take it extremely seriously. Thanks, Blake. I think we've got time for one more of our questions before we go to um, questions from the audience. Um, Rodney, we'll start with you on this. Let's talk about the future of cybercrime. Which future threats concern you the most? I think we're in it right now. Um, and I call it social media. Um, how do you want to destroy the greatest country in the world? Hmm? You put them on social media, everybody's in it, and you start doing things to social media to help divide them. You divide them. A divided house falls, and we're in the middle of it right now. So I need people to be smarter than the artificial intelligence that is being used to drive social media. Um, people have learned now how to weaponize it. There's books on it, okay? Everything you see on social media ain't real. And they can make it look really real. The whole deep fake, like making your lips look like they're saying something you're not saying. Like it's, there's so much. And it puts you in a box where reality only seems to be what you see and what everybody who agrees with you see. And that is not the truth. So I need everybody to continue to be critical thinkers. Okay. Go search for the truth yourself. Facebook is not the news. All right. There may be some information in there, but it, it has a very strong power to influence. And it's all money driven. That's how it was started. And they didn't um, see the, um, uh, the consequences of giving you an ad that you're going to buy um, as quickly as possible or to predict what you want to buy next. Like there's unintended consequences and we're seeing them right now. And I think that's what's being used as the latest cyber attack. That's me. Yep. Thanks, Rodney. Welcome. Blake, Blake what do you think about um, the future threats? What concerns you? Yeah. <laughs> Um, watch the social experiment. Like Rodney said, the social experiment is, is mind blowing as, as to what they do with social media. Um, I think um, it's, it's, it's really becoming 
a big serious business for these hackers. So they're, they're not just some kid in their basement, you know, at one o'clock in the morning. These are businesses that are sending out ransomware. They're state actors. There's, there's businesses with a profit loss statement and board meetings sending out ransomware and other attacks. Um, and, and that just keeps growing and they're going to keep making money. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the, where we're seeing a big change is, is really the impact on, on healthcare and personal data, holding personal data for ransom instead of just encrypting the computers. And then when you shut down a hospital for a week, like was done here in the, um, over, uh, um, during the pandemic, you know, if they can't access their electronic medical records, that really impacts healthcare delivery, which can end up with bad outcomes for uh, patients. And so um, it is serious that, uh, you know, and, and I think that's going to step up. Thanks, Blake. Mike, what are your thoughts on the future threats that we're facing? Well, I agree with everyone about the social media. Um, there was a quote, I think it was from Benjamin Franklin that says, you can't trust everything you read on the internet. I'm not sure if you read that somewhere. Um, but <laughs> that goes to the point that uh, you can't trust everything you read on the internet. I think the, the latest and greatest in the, the future is going to be more directed uh, ransomware attacks. It's easy money. Um, they're hitting large companies. They're hitting. They're starting to move to small municipalities, as we heard with the the small ones in Colorado, um, Dallas, and, and around Texas had quite a few small municipalities hit. But even yourself, a quick click on a link at your home computer, and they want fifty bucks. That's it. You send the fifty bucks because you don't want to hassle around. You don't have backups, and you need your family to get back on the computer systems. I can see that becoming more and more prevalent. Um, because it's easy money. It's the thousand 7-Elevens again. You can hit a lot of small people really quickly. Um, so I think that'll be like the next phase. It's already happening, as we said. There's nothing really new about it. I think just it's going to expand and grow. Thanks, Mike. Um, we're going to turn to audience questions now. It's that time. Um, and actually, Mike, I'll send this um, Actually, Blake, sorry, I'll send this one to you. The first question relates to something Mike was just talking about. Um, it's a question from Warren. What can we do to defend our networks and data from ransomware? Do backups help? Yeah, backups definitely uh, help. And, and because regardless of how many things you throw in, 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 you know, in their path, it just takes one person to click on something. So, um, and, and to, you know, as you add on more layers of defense, you know, if they really want your data, they're going to get through it. Or if one person clicks on that thing accidentally. So we want backups and we want backups that, that um, I mentioned that were air gapped. And what air gapped means is what, what we do is we put an appliance in house that captures all that data that's on your network. But then throughout the day, it, it encrypts it and puts it off site so that if somebody breaks into your data, they can't get to that backup data. Um, it also helps if there's a fire and, and other things. The other thing that we do is, is because there are instances where they've encrypted things like Microsoft 365, is you also wanna think about backing up your cloud email um, and your, your OneDrive or your Google Drive. Um, because if that stuff's encrypted or an employee leaves and they delete that, Microsoft and Google are backing up your data as a whole, but they're not, it, it, trying to get granular recovery because, you know, Amy, you know, accidentally encrypts her whole um, email folder is a lot harder. Microsoft's not going to help her out. Great. Thanks. Uh, Mike, what do you have to say about that? Yeah. Backups. When we speak of backups, it's the power of three. You can back up locally, you can back up um, into the cloud, and then you have to have an offsite. Nothing can touch it backup. So um, that's something to always uh, consider. And, and uh, I would definitely highlight um, knowing what your data is, knowing what your important data is. You don't necessarily have to encrypt or spend the money to encrypt everything. If you have um, lots of marketing or superior files that, that don't really matter, you know, if it's out to the world anyway, because you want it to. But if you have any P PII, personally identifiable information on your employees or your customers, those are the things you really are going to want to focus down on and add that um, second level, third level of protections. Thanks, Mike. 
Rodney, what can you tell us about protecting ourselves from ransomware? I'll be the last person to say it. Back up, back up, back up. And not just any backup, but the offsite backups. That is your best protection against this ransomware threat. There was an organization that Blake had alluded to earlier, and I know he's talking about, um, that got hit with a ransomware attack. Um, from what I've been able to deduct, they paid about $1.8 million to get their data back. And um, the reason that they had to pay that ransom, I mean, you would think an organization that size would have offsite backups correctly, but they likely had servers on site that all their information was being backed up to, and that got hit. So let me help you all understand how this ransomware works. Once it's in one computer, okay, it does a scan of your whole network from your one computer, all right? And it finds all the computers on your network. If you have a server where your files are, it, it finds that too. And it makes a copy of itself, and it sends it to every computer it found. And it does this in seconds. The time it takes you to go to the bathroom, wash your hands, come back. And when it executes, it hits all the systems and it's very, very fast. It's very aggressive. So if all your backups are there at your business, whether it's an external hard drive, it's going to hit that. If it's a server on your network, it's going to hit that. But those offsite backups, you'll be able to pull a backup from the day before and be okay. And I have to pay the ransom. So we're in a day and time where you should not be paying ransom for ransomware attacks. You should have your backups together. Don't know how to do it. Come see us. We'll help you. Thanks, Rodney. Welcome. Um, Mike, I'm going to send this question to you. Um, this is a question from Lily. If you're remote working and the, the company doesn't give you a company computer, what's the best way to protect your data? There's lots of different ways. Um, you can uh, provide, there's a um, cloud service that encrypts all your data for you. There's different kinds like that that you can do. Um, my personal recommendation, especially if you're dealing with a small business and they can't provide you that that laptop or, you know, the work computer is to buy a USB uh, drive, external hard drive. You can back up to the hard drive weekly, daily, depending on your data needs, and then just remove that USB hard drive so that it's not consistently plugged into your computer and it's only there to recover. So you pop it in, do your backup, unplug it, and away you go. That would be the cheap and uh, cost-effective version. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Rodney, what if you don't have a company computer? Um, so on top of what Mike said, when you are backing up your data to those USB drives, those things are ultra mobile. They can be snatched up by somebody. So please make sure you encrypt those external drives. Again, I'm talking about Windows 10 Pro and a feature in it called BitLocker. So you can run BitLocker on those external drives. So if you lose it or if somebody snatches it and gets your external drive, when they plug it into their computer, it's a brick. It shows up as not functional. And if they don't know the password, they're not going to get in it. They're not getting in it. Trust me on that one. Um, if your um, company is not giving you a computer to work with, um, you, you may need to make some, some small investments on your, on your personal computer. Get a paid computer security program, okay? Do not use Kaspersky. You understand what I'm saying? Kaspersky. As a little K icon, um, that is a gift from our, our great friends from Russia. It has been proven that they have backdoor access in that program. They say they don't anymore, but I don't trust it. I already need to see it once. I have trust issues. You fool me once, you know, that's, that's all it takes for me. So, um, but get yourself like a Norton subscription. Get, uh, you know, McAfee, get whatever you want. Just make sure it's paid. Don't get the free stuff because free stuff is free. Windows Defender is not enough, okay? I want to make sure I say it again. Windows Defender is a free antivirus that comes with Microsoft Windows. It is not enough. I am tracking viruses and malware that look specifically for Windows Defender to disable it and then run all its malware routines. So get yourself a paid subscription to something and back up your computer to the cloud. Use Carbonite if you're looking for something that you need. Carbonite.com, pretty good stuff. Thanks, Rodney. Welcome. Blake, what about people who don't have a company computer? Um, yeah, they've hit, they've hit most of it. Uh, there, there, there are some good uh, solutions to remote access uh, if you've got a computer in the office. Um, you know, it's, and it's a last ditch effort. Things like go to my PC that you know, has multi-factor authentication where you've got to have another key code to get in. And then that, that actually times out so when you go to the bathroom, like two minutes later, your kids jump on your computer. We want to make sure it times out. But I think one of the things, if, you know, us as business owners, we never consider the cost of our employees' times. And so um, 
you know, if, if, if Lily is spending an extra 10 minutes a day trying to get into her go to my PC or trying to back up her stuff or trying to do this, let's, let's pretend Lily makes $30,000 a year. That's 40,000 for, you know, all in um, expenses for, for Lily. That's $20 an hour that she's making, you know, all in. If it costs her, you know, a half an hour a day, um, because she's got to mess around with these things, that's 10 hours, every, $10 every day over 200 work days in a year, that more than pays for a computer for Lily, right? And, and we see this over and over again that, that, you know, whether it's the attorney that doesn't want to buy a new computer because he's on a 10 year old computer that slows him down. Well, you're billing 500 bucks an hour, you could bill out a little bit more maybe. So, so I'll get off my soapbox. I, 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 we, we, need to, we, we need to make sure our employees can do their jobs because it, it gets expensive when they mess around with this stuff and stuff that slows them down. Thanks, Blake. Um, Jen, correct me if I'm wrong. Do we have time for one more quick question? Yep. Okay, great. We can fit this in. So this question is from Amy. What are some of the ways businesses can train employees not to do that one click? Rodney, let's start with you. PikesPeakSBDC.org. PikesPeakSBDC.org. <laughs> I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Rodney. Mike, what do you have to add? <laughs> I, that, that's a good one. Uh, we also <laughs> offer training uh, to uh, both the leadership of a company and to the employees. I think they're two kind of separate uh, training, training modules. Um, a lot of overlap, but, uh, you know, to let everyone know. But uh, the resources are out there. It's really about frequent and updated training. Uh, how many people go to the same cyber training year after year for their once a year, go through the slides, clicky, clicky, um, you know, keep it fresh, keep it new and uh, do it often. Thanks, Mike. Blake, how do we prevent that one click? Yeah. Um, keep reminding your employees uh, not to do it. They, they click about sending checks out. So if you get the email, um, I've made it very clear to, to our accounting people that, and, and we talk about it, that, that they are not supposed to pay new vendors, change addresses, do anything like that, pay anything out of the ordinary without clearing it with me personally first. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, um, the security awareness training is, you know, what we offer is something that, you know, if, if you've actually got some funds to spend on it, you can go out and do the free stuff. Like Grace is talking about learning cybersecurity. There's a ton you can learn on Google about how to protect you and your business and, and to do it for free if you're a small business. When you start getting into a hospital, you need to formalize it. And to do that, there's tools out there that will send out fake phishing emails and stuff to people. When they click on it, it takes them to a page that says, hey, here's some training for you because you accidentally clicked on something. Um, and so it depends again on your size. Do you want to automate it and make it formal so that you can actually track it for training purposes, for HR purposes? Um, but if you've got a, a, you know, a business under five employees, you know, Google and YouTube and all these things are, are great resources. But watch out because it was actually Abraham Lincoln that said the, the thing about the internet. So that was fake news, what Mike said. So. That Thanks, damn fake news. <laughs> Thanks for clearing it up. Um, well, that's, that's all we've got time for. Um, thank you so much for being here for this panel. Um, I know we've had a lot of great answers and information today. Um, please join us for the human resources panel next week. I would really like to thank Rodney and Mike and Blake for their time. And thanks again to each of our sponsors.